so today we are going to deal about a very important topic which is pre anesthetic checkup even after watching this video if you got a residency in md anesthesia you are go you are going to come back to this channel and watch this video once again this is a very important topic many mcqs have been asked from this topic in the previous year exams so let's get started so why do we have to do a pre anesthetic checkup or pac we do pac for risk stratification risk stratification for risk stratification of the patient so why do we need to do a risk stratification first thing is to optimize the patient condition if the patient is having any comorbidities like hypertension diabetes uncontrolled asthma if the patient is an epileptic patient we need to optimize all those conditions before posting him for an elective surgery so to optimize the patient's condition to optimize the patient condition and secondly after optimizing the patient after controlling all the comorbidities we need to formulate a plan to formulate a plan of anesthesia to formulate the plan of anesthesia accordingly plan of anesthesia accordingly all right so what are the components of pre anesthetic checkup what are the components of pre anesthetic checkup or pre anesthetic evaluation or pre anesthetic evaluation the first and the foremost important thing is the first thing is a focused history the focused history of the patient is the most important it includes present history past history so present history in present history what we are going to ask any significant upper respiratory tract infection complaints like cold cough whether patient is having a fever so for example fever or upper respiratory tract infection then any acute attacks of asthma recent asthma shortness of breath asthma attacks okay all this we will be asking in the present history then the past medical history past history in the past history we will be asking about hypertension diabetes asthma epilepsy any history of tuberculosis history of tuberculosis all right this is important then the past history of any medication whether the patient is taking medications it could be allopathic medications homeo medications or any herbal medication ayurvedic medication okay previous history of allergies to the patient any drug allergies if the patient has undergone a previous surgical procedure did the procedure went uneventful or were there any complications in the intraop or postoperative whether it would it might be surgical related complications or anesthetic complication whether the patient was admitted in icu after the surgery if he, if he was on a ventilator for how many days was he on a ventilator okay so previous history of surgeries or anesthetic complications previous history of surgeries or anesthetic complications surgeries or anesthetic complications any history of icu stay in the past icu stay in the past and for females we also ask the menstrual history you also ask the menstrual history then general physical examination then you will do general physical examination where you will take the patient height weight you will measure the bmi of the patient these all are very important 
measuring the weight of the patient knowing the height of the patient is very important and it has a significance for the neuroaxial anesthesia for the spinal anesthesia and also while giving a general anesthesia the bmi or the body weight does matter then we'll go for systemic examination systemic examination we'll also see the pallor ictus clubbing okay any pedal edema every from head to toe examination has to be done in the pac in the systemic examination for cvs we'll be checking the heart sounds we'll we'll be auscultating then we also monitor the heart rate how much is the patient baseline heart rate blood pressure okay we check the room air saturation we check the room air saturation for the smoker for smoker patients known asthmatics or patient who have a history of obstructive sleep apnea obstructive uh, knowing the history of obstructive sleep apnea is also very important we have to ask if the patient is on, already on any cpap any cpap okay you should see for the breath sounds you will auscultate for the breath sounds we should see whether there are any crackles okay or wheeze all right then uh, we'll ask about the uh, bilateral air entry we'll auscultate for bilateral air entry and we'll see the auscultatory findings also okay then we'll ask about addictions addictions is very important we should ask the patient about the history of any alcoholism or uh, smoking or tobacco chewing alcohol or smoking history alcohol or smoking history from smoking history we can evaluate the pack years pack years of smoking because pack years of smoking is directly related to the post operative complications post operative pul pulmonary complications okay so how do you calculate pack years it is number of cigarettes number of number of cigarettes smoked number of cigarettes smoked per day number of cigarettes smoked per day divided by 20 because each pack of cigarette box is considered to be having 20 cigarettes so number of cigarettes smoked per day by 20 into number of years of smoking into number of years of smoking so in general one pack year one pack year one pack year represent that one pack year represent that he will take 20 cigarettes 20 cigarettes per day per day for one year if the patient has been taking 20 cigarettes per day per one year it is called as one pack year for one year for one year all right so moving on we will go for airway assessment we'll have to do a quick air keep quick airway assessment for every patient why do we do airway assessment if we are anticipating any difficult airway we have to prepare the patient for a difficult airway so we have to do airway assessment for every patient airway assessment is the most important component of the pre anesthetic evaluation so in the airway assessment as said before we will be asking the history of obstructive sleep apnea and any nasal breathing or snoring nasal breathing nasal breathing snoring if patient has undergone a previous surgery then we should also ask for any history of difficult intubation in the past any history of difficult intubation on in the past difficult intubation in the past all right so to remember easily airway assessment there is something called lemon score there is something called, known as lemon score dealing with l l means look externally l for look externally look for any facial trauma any mandible or maxillary dislocation in case of rta patients 
any facial trauma if the patient is having a beard or mustache beard or mustache like you can see here Alu Arjun from Pushpa has a lot of beard and mustache he has to get a part preparation done if he has to undergo a GA okay then we have prominent incisors if the patient is having a prominent incisors it will become a difficult laryngoscopy okay then tongue whether the patient is having a large tongue externally we all we should also look for the neck circumference neck circumference in obese patients the neck circumference will be very large and if it is more than 43 cm if it is more than 43 cm it is going to be a difficult intubation it is going to be a difficult intubation or if it is more than 41 cm in females it is going to be a difficult intubation so after looking externally then we have to evaluate evaluate 332 there is a rule called 332 evaluate 3 3 and 2 all right so the 332 rule is all about interincisor distance interincisor distance The interincisor distance is measured by asking the patient to put the three fingers vertically in his mouth like you can see in this picture here. So the patient is about to uh, able to put all the three fingers in his mouth. So three finger mouth opening, three finger, three finger breadth, three finger breadth or five centimeters, five centimeters or three fingers is the normal interincisor distance. Then the next three is thyromental distance. Thyromental distance. Here you can see in this picture, he is able, able to place three fingers from thyroid notch to mentum. If you are able to place three fingers, then it is a good sign for intubation and laryngoscopy. So three finger thyromental distance or it is more than 6.5 centimeters or it has to be more than 6.5 centimeters it is if it is less than 5 centimeters or 4.5 centimeters then it will signify that it is a difficult intubation or laryngoscopy okay thyromental distance this is also known as partial stest this is also known as partial stest then we have number two it will signify the distance between the high, hyoid and mentum distance between the hyoid and mentum if this is mentum this is hyoid the hyomental distance distance between hyoid and mentum hyoid and mentum 332 okay then we have something called sternomental distance sterno sternomental distance sternomental distance the name itself signifies that it is the distance between the sternal notch and mentum Stern, sternal notch distance between sternum Distance between the sternum and mentum. Sternum and mentum. This is also known as Sava test. This is also known as Sava test. Okay, is this clear? How much should be the normal sternomental distance? It is more than 12.5 centimeters. More than 12.5 centimeters. This test has a very high sensitivity and specificity high sensitivity and specificity in some books it is also given that 
sternomental distance is the single best predictor for difficult intubation and laryngoscopy single best predictor for difficult intubation high sensitivity and specificity See? then we also have something called rhtmd which is the ratio of height ratio of height to thyromental distance ratio of height to thyromental distance rhtmd ratio of height to thyromental distance the normal is 23.5 less than 3.5 23.5 is normal if it is more than 23.5 it is indicates difficult laryngoscopy it indicates difficult laryngoscopy all right even rhtmd the ratio of height to thyromental distance has a very good specificity and sensitivity all right next moving on we have something called upper lip bite test upper lip bite test here in this picture we can see a person is biting this his upper lip using his lower incisors above the vermilion line so using his in, lower incisors he is able to bite the upper lip okay this test is done to assess the mandibular function this is a test for the assessment of is a test for the assessment of mandibular function this is a test for the assessment of mandibular function mandibular function or mandibular movement mandibular movement this test is also known as catch test this test is also known as catch test all right so moving on we have finished l and e from the lemon score now we are we have come to m m for the most famous mallam party grading mallam party grading mallam party grading this is a previous year question pyq mallam party grading is a most famous question of the examiners for pre neat pg or inicet entrance examinations so in mallam party grading there are four grades initially so grade 1 grade 1 here you can see the hard palate hard palate you can see the soft palate soft palate you can see the tonsillar pillars tonsillar pillars you can see the complete uvula including the tip you can see the complete uvula including the tip in this image you can see there is complete uvula there are tonsillar pillars anterior and posterior pillars you can see the soft palate and you can see the complete hard palate so this is mallampatti 1 clear moving on to mallampatti 2 here you can see hard palate soft palate the fossas or the fossas then the tonsillar pillars the tonsillar pillars tonsillar pillars are absent the tonsillar pillars are absent in the the posterior tonsillar pillars are not seen in mallampatti 2 okay and uvula you can't see the tip of the uvula tip not seen tip not seen in mallampatti grade 2 so in this picture you can see you can see the soft palate you can see the uvula but you can't see the tip of the uvula okay you can see only the anterior pillars so you can't see the posterior tonsillar pillars you can't see the tip so the tonsillar pillars absent or huh? not seen tonsillar pillars are absent or not seen in type or grade 2 of mallampatti then moving on to grade 3 or score 3 here you can see the hard palate in the grade 3 you can see the hard palate then you can see soft palate 
here only the base of will is seen only the base of will is seen only the base of will is seen in grade 3 so here you can see in this picture only the base of the will is seen okay so this is grade 3 this is grade 2 is it clear and in grade 4 this is grade 4 you are able to see only the hard palate you can't see any soft palate or uvula you can see only the hard palate so this is grade 4 the grade 4 was initially not there in the malampati grading it was a modified malampati grading which was given by samson and young samson and young samson and young modified the malampati grading into modified malampati and he gave grade 4 and then there is something called grade 0 in this image you can see there is grade 0 where you are able to see even the epiglottis where you are able to see even the epiglottis this is known as grade 0 all right so basically malampati is a predictor of difficult intubation malampati is the predictor of difficult intubation then moving on we have something for Cormac Lehane grading, it is a direct laryngoscopic view. This grading was done based on the direct laryngoscopy. We don't do this in the PAC. But for time being, since we are learning about Malampati, don't get confused. There is also something, uh, entity called Cormac Lehane grading. So in the Cormac Lehane grading, it will give the laryngoscopic view of the difficult airway. Laryngoscopic view of the difficult airway. This grading is done based on the laryngoscopic view of the glottic opening. Glottic opening. So, there are four grades. In the grade one, there is full view of the glottis. You, you are able to see completely the uh, vocal cords. In grade two, there is only a partial view of the vocal cords. Okay. In grade three, only epiglottis is seen. And in grade four, neither epiglottis nor the glottis. You can't see the epiglottis or the vocal cords in grade four. Okay. Just remember that there is some grade. There is something entity known as Cormac Lehane grading, which is different from Malampati grading. Okay. Okay. Now we have finished lemon. The look externally, evaluate 332. Then we have learned about the Malampati grading. Then what is O? O for obstruction. O for obstruction. So look for any airway obstruction if the patient is having any oral tumor or a thyroid mass compressing the airway or a foreign body like a coin in the uh, pediatric patients. So look for any obstruction. Obstruction can be a tumor or a foreign body. Tumor or a foreign body. All right. Then what is N? N is neck movement or neck mobility. Neck movement or neck mobility neck mobility look for neck flexion and extension neck flexion and extension why is neck flexion and extension important for us to position the patient for the laryngoscopy or intubation to keep the patient in sniffing position okay if there is a restricted extension then it will be a difficult laryngoscopy okay so both are directly linked so it is our responsibility for check, to check the neck mobility at the pre-anesthetic evaluation. Here you can see the person is flexing his neck. We ask the person to touch his touch his sternum. We are to keep his chin to the sternum. Then we are going to check the flexion. And a similarly extension, we ask the patient to look at the ceiling. When the patient looks at the ceiling, then it is a good ex, good extension. All right. So neck flexion and extension. After completing the Lemon score. The highest score the person can get then which is directly linked with the difficulty of the intubation or laryngoscopy so more the lemon score more difficulty difficulty i hope this is clear now moving on last part of the airway examination which is done especially for diabetic patients okay in diabetic patients In diabetic patient, there is accumulation of the glycosylated collagen, glycosylated collagen in the joints. Okay. 
there is accumulation accumulation of glycosylated collagen in the joints this will make the joint stiff it they, it will restrict the movement of the joints so this is known as stiff joint syndrome stiff joint syndrome or limited joint mobility syndrome limited joint mobility syndrome so uh, when there is deposition of glycosylated collagen there is also a deposition of this collagen in the neck joints for extension and flexion atlanto occipital and atlanto occipital joint is also affected so the patient extension is also going to be affected so we have to do a screening of the screening for difficult intubation or laryngoscopy in diabetic patients especially by doing two screening tests two screening tests are available two screening tests are available so the first one is prayer sign the first one is prayer sign the inability of the patient inability of the patient to approximate the inability of the patient to approximate the palmar surfaces of his fingers we we'll ask the patient to uh, put the sign like how we keep for prayer and he will be able if he is able to approximate all the phalanges interphalangeal joints together then it is a good sign if he is unable to do then the joints are affected okay then this is a positive prayer sign in this image also you can see over here there is a gap so the patient is not able to approximate his interphalangeal joints inability to approximate inability to approximate the palmar surfaces palmar surfaces of interphalangeal joints interphalangeal joints interphalangeal joints is a positive prayer sign then next is a palm print sign next is a palm print sign next is a palm print sign in this palm print sign the patient hand is painted with black ink completely and he is asked to firmly press the hand over a white paper so palm print sign the patient is asked to press the hand painted with black ink press the hand with black ink over a white paper and we look for any deficiency in the interphalangeal areas once the patient imprinted the imprint is present we'll see that in the fourth or fifth interphalangeal joints there is a deficit of the ink or deficit of the print if that is present then it is a positive positive palm print sign and it will uh, signify that there is a there is going to be a difficult intubation or difficult neck extension okay and we'll ask the patient to ask the patient to we'll ask the patient to press over the paper and we'll look for look for any deficit look for any deficit of interphalangeal joints of the fingers interphalangeal joints interphalangeal joints okay these are the two screening tests for the diabetic patients now moving on what are other examinations we do in the pre anesthetic checkup spine examination is very important because we we are giving central neuroaxial blockade for spinal epidural anesthesia we have to go for we have to look at the spine is the spine in the midline are there any midline tumors of the spine okay is there any evidence of uh, kyphosis or scoliosis so is the spine in the midline any kyphoscoliosis any kyphoscoliosis are the interspinous spaces good or is there a bamboo spine or there are calcified ligaments in old age 
okay interspinous spaces all right and also in the pediatric patients in the pediatric patients sometimes patients are posted for congenital hydrocel and all so in the pediatric patients it is very important to look for any heart murmurs for any congenital or congenital heart diseases and also it is very important to look for any syndromes is a child suffering from any syndromes like peri robin syndrome peri robin syndrome these are the few syndromes in which the patient neck extension flexion or the patient airway patient tongue patient mouth opening all these are affected due to cleft lip cleft palate okay the examples of those syndromes are peri robin syndrome treacher colin syndrome treacher colin syndrome then we have down syndrome down syndrome then we have clipple feel syndrome clipple feel syndrome then we have golden arch syndrome just remember that while evaluating a pediatric patient we also have to look for any congenital anomalies then we have risk stratification risk stratification now you have you have taken all the history of the patient from the history you are going to stratify the patient uh, according to his risk factors for the surgery okay risk stratification the american society of anesthesiologists asa have graded uh, the based on all the risk factors comorbidities and patient age and everything they have divided uh, they have given a grading called asa grading asa grading for risk stratification asa asa grading for risk factor risk stratification this is important this could be a this could be an mcq they might give a case scenario stating the comorbidities of the patient the, what all medication the patient is on and all of the details and they might ask you under which asa category the patient will come so this is very important so asa grade 1 in the asa grade 1 it includes patients who are healthy patients who are healthy without any comorbidities a normal healthy patient will come under asa grade 1 asa grade 2 this includes a patient with mild systemic disease a patient with mild systemic disease mild systemic disease examples include patient with hypertension but it is controlled a patient with diabetes but it is controlled diabetes okay other examples which are uh, a little twisted are patient without any functional limitations patient without any functional limitations patient has a systemic disease but it is not causing any functional limitation without functional without functional limitations all right so the examples are so the examples are patient with mild hypertension patient with mild hypertension diabetes a social alcohol drinker social alcoholic if you are a social alcoholic that does not mean you will come under as1 you are as2 social alcoholic drinker then patient with a bmi bmi of 30 to 40 any pregnant female will come under as2 pregnant female pregnant female if you are a smoker you are automatically not not going to come under as1 smokers are as2 and more not as1 okay then there is stage 3 okay in stage 3 patients will have severe systemic disease 
patients will have severe systemic disease with functional limitation. A patient with severe systemic disease severe systemic disease with functional limitation with functional limitation examples are poorly controlled hypertension poorly controlled diabetes okay so poorly controlled poorly controlled hypertension diabetes mellitus a chronic smoker with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease copd patients morbidly obese patients morbidly obese patients with a bma of more than 40 with a bma of more than 40 then we have end stage renal disease or end stage kidney disease patients who are on regular dialysis kidney disease and stage kidney disease patients who are undergoing regular dialysis with regularly scheduled dialysis regularly scheduled dialysis then patients with history of myocardial infarction or history of uh, cva attack more than three months it has been more than three months since the patient had an attack of a severe or stroke. Then they will come under ASA 3. Okay. Now moving on to ASA 4. ASA 4 includes patients with severe systemic disease, which is a constant threat to life. Which is a constant threat to life. A patient with severe systemic disease. A patient with severe systemic disease. which is a constant threat to life which is a constant threat to life so what are the examples for grade 4 less than 3 months less than 3 month old CVA or stroke less than 3 months old CVA or myocardial infarction and end stage renal disease or end stage kidney disease patients who are not on regularly scheduled dialysis not undergoing not undergoing regular dialysis they come under ASA grade 4 next we have ASA grade 5 a grade 5 patient is a moribund patient moribund patient this patient is not expected to survive without a surgery. The patient is not expected to survive without a surgery. He will come under ASA grade 5. A moribund patient not expected, not expected to survive, survive without a surgery, without a operation or surgery. The patient came with a ruptured aortic aneurysm we have to do surgery immediately so he is a grade 5 patient examples include a ruptured aortic aneurysm ruptured aortic ruptured aortic aneurysm or a patient with big ic bleed a patient with ic bleed patient with massive ic bleed he will come under as5 then the last grade which is as6 a declared brain dead patient the patient is declared as brain dead so his organs can be used for donation declared brain dead patient a declared brain dead patient that patient for organ donation for organ donation and lastly if there is e if it is an emergency surgery and the patient is a ASA grade 2 patient came for emergency surgery then we will make the grading as 2E okay so if there is E for any ASA grading then it indicates that it is an emergency surgery emergency emergency surgery okay I hope this is clear okay now moving on 
Now you have seen the PAC, you have graded the patient. The patient is a known uh, risk of cardiovascular. Uh, there are symptoms of cardiovascular disease or patient is a known cardiovascular disease. So he'll need more evaluation other than what we have done till now. The cardiovascular patients need a little bit more evaluation. So we have to learn about Lee's revised cardiac index. Lee's revised cardiac index. This is a risk index for cardiac patients. This is a risk stratification for cardiac patients. This is also very important. So in this, there are around six uh, risk factors. So based on the risk factors, we will grade the patient. How much risk is he going to have intraoperatively and postoperatively? Okay. The first one is, what kind of surgery is it? Is it a high risk surgery? What is a high risk surgery? See, low risk surgery, for example, cataract, lipoma excision, these are low risk surgeries. High risk surgeries are uh, thoracic surgery or abdominal aortic aneurysm surgery or a neurosurgery. These are all high risk surgeries. Okay. So thoracic, abdominal surgeries, these are high risk surgeries. Any chest trauma. Okay. Then there, then any prior history of transient ischemic attacks or cerebrovascular accident. Any history of CV or TIA. Then we have diabetes, diabetes who is on insulin therapy, a diabetic patient on insulin therapy. Diabetic patient on insulin therapy. Then a patient with a kidney disease, patient having serum creatinine, serum creatinine more than 2 mg per deciliter, serum creatinine more than 2 mg per deciliter. Then we have a patient with history of ischemic heart disease, patient with history of ischemic heart disease, then patient with history of congestive heart failure, patient with history of congestive heart failure, congestive heart failure. So the, all these are risk factors for cardiac patients and each risk factor will hold one point and as the number of points increases, the risk for the major cardiac events intraoperatively also significantly increases. So what other additional investigations are needed for a cardiac patient? Additional, additional investigations for cardiac patients. A 12 lead ECG, a 12 lead 12 lead electrocardiogram, 12 lead ECG. So a 12 lead ECG is required only for cardiac patients, patients undergoing high risk surgery, any symptomatic patients. The ECG is not recommended for every patient undergoing an elective surgery. All right. So it is not recommended for patients who are asymptomatic, no previous cardiac history. It is not recommended and patient undergoing a cataract surgery or a low risk surgery, then also an ECG is not recommended. Then a 2D echo, 2D echocardiography, then if required a treadmill test, treadmill test to know the cardiopulmonary reserve, okay, to know the ischemic threshold for the patient, we'll do treadmill test, then we can also do a dobutamine pharmacological stress test or a dobutamine stress test, dobutamine stress test. If still required, the patient may need have to go for an angiography. Angiography in the cath lab. Angiography. He will need a cardiologist opinion. Cardiology. So, okay. The patient has to undergo all these investigations if he is a known cardiac case. Then, we have to assess the functional capacity also. Assess the functional capacity. How do you assess the patient's functional capacity in the pre-operative room or in the pre-AC clinic? Functional capacity. Firstly, what is functional capacity? It is the metabolic equivalence of TAS. We measure functional capacity in the units of metabolic equivalence of TAS. Metabolic equivalence of task or we can call them as METS METS 
what is this metabolic equivalent indicate it indicates the amount of amount of oxygen consumed by a person at rest amount of oxygen consumption when the person is relaxed and he is sitting at rest consumption while at rest is called as metabolic equivalent and how much is metabolic equivalent it is about 3.5 ml per kg per minute of oxygen is consumed per minute okay this will give the functional capacity so in the pre operative room uh, if the per person is able to climb two flights of stairs usually will consider that the metabolic equivalence of the meds is more than 4 for that person if it is less than 4 then it will indicate that the person is having a poor cardiopulmonary reserve or poor functional capacity okay so less than 4 meds is a line which indicates is a line which indicates poor functional capacity poor functional capacity and the person might need further evaluation by a cardiologist or the person might require a spirometry or pulmonary function test okay indicates poor functional capacity and needs further evaluation needs further needs further evaluation i hope this is clear then the last thing we are going to discuss is bedside pulmonary function test bedside pulmonary function test before going to the pre operative orders what we write in the P in the psc and what orders we instructions we give for the surgeons first we are, uh, will know what is bedside pulmonary function test we don't advise a spirometry for every person so in the psc if you think that the person needs a spirometry just do one or two bedside pulmonary function tests so that if required we can go for a spirometry bedside pulmonary function test we'll just know three simple tests which can be done easily at the psc the first test is single breath count single breath count the first test is single breath count the patient is asked to take a deep breath then exhale counting numbers 1 2 3 and so far till the patient is able to hold his breath okay patient is asked to take a deep breath take a deep breath then exhale then exhale counting the numbers 1 2 3 and so on counting 1 2 3 till the patient cannot hold his breath till the patient cannot hold his breath cannot hold his breath if the count is more than 40 then the vital capacity of the patient is normal it will this will signify that it is a normal vital capacity what is vital capacity vital capacity is the maximum air that can be maximum air that can be expired after a maximal inspiration maximum maximal air that can be maximum air that can be expired after a maximal inspiration after maximum inspiration it is about 60 to 70 ml per kg for an adult or usually in the it is given as 4800 ml 4800 ml when we add 1200 of uh, residual value volume for this vital capacity it is called total lung volume okay so vital capacity then we have something for breath holding time we, we discussed about single breath count now we are dealing with breath holding time breath holding time we'll ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold the breath we'll ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold the breath for as long as possible take a deep breath and hold it 
and hold for as long as he can as long as possible hold it for as long as possible is it clear so if it is more than 25 seconds this is more than 25 seconds it is normal if the patient is unable to hold the breath for less than 15 seconds then it is a predictor of then it is a predictor of poor cardiopulmonary reserve 25 seconds is normal less than 15 seconds indicates that the patient is having a poor cardiopulmonary reserve poor cardiopulmonary reserve poor cardiopulmonary reserve the last bedside pft we are discussing is the forced expiratory time it is the forced expiratory forced expiratory time time this test will simply tell us in the psc if the patient is having an obstructive pathology or restrictive pathology okay to know obstructive or restrictive pathology restrictive lung disease restrictive lung disease in this the patient takes a deep breath and exhales forcefully and while the patient is exhaling we are going to auscultate uh, we are going to keep the diaphragm of the stet on the trachea and listen to the expiration so if the force expiratory time is 3 to 5 seconds it is normal that is the time the patient has a forcefully expirated how much time he has taken to forcefully forcefully expire is 3 to 5 seconds which is normal if the time is more than 5 seconds it will indicate that it is an obstructive pathology the patient is having an obstructive lung disease a copd if he has taken less than 3 seconds then it is a restrictive lung disease then it is a restrictive lung disease then to whom do you advise a chest x ray chest x ray is advised only if the patient is have, having a, a symptoms of cold cough a patient has a recent upper respiratory tract infection which is unresolved or even after the antibiotics or the patient is having fever with cough okay then we are going to advise a chest x ray without a positive medical history it is not usually advised so a positive medical history or patient is a chronic smoker positive medical history or chronic smoker smoker or a recent urta or recent urta so in these cases we are going to check for intraoperative and postoperative pulmonary complications that is why we ask for a chest x ray not need no need of regular advice of chest x ray is this clear okay the last is pyrometry if all these bedside pfts if any of these are abnormal then we go for a pulmonary function test by the pulmonologist he'll do a spirometry which is the most commonly performed pulmonary function test spirometry most commonly performed and the most basic pulmonary function test most common most basic is pulmonary function test this pyrometry will give you different volumes and different flows and it will also give the resistance to the flow so it will measure it will measure flow and resistance flow and resistance all right so in the next video we'll uh, talk about the preoperative orders the pre medication uh, what are the npo orders and how to modify different drugs which the patient have been already using how we have to modify the dosage or which drugs to skip which drugs to continue all these important things we are going to uh, discuss in the next top uh, next video so if you like the video just click the like button if you have not haven't subscribed to the channel subscribe and you also know the drill you need to follow the instagram page anesthesia notes for more useful tips and more useful content on anesthesia thank you